All right. I think we're ready to record and go to the Facebook Live. How long is this, by the way? Uh, three hours. Is that okay? Oh, perfect. Okay. Man, <laughs> anything less than two, I'd be like... Yeah. You'd have crossed the street for less than two. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, so we're going to start the Facebook Live. We're going to yeah. start the uh, recording. Uh, it is Carco and Carney. I'm on Morgan, uh, right by 31st, outside of Kimsky in Bridgeport. That's Chef Juan. And in the back seat, I have Mike Gebert, the editor of Food Editor. We're going to talk about the Food Editor 2019 uh, compendium that is newly out, but we're also going to eat Kimsky food. We've got it just decked out on my dashboard. But before we do any of this, oh, there's Food Editor 99 right there. Uh, before we do any of that, I should mention Carcon Carne is presented by the Autobarn Mazda of Evanston. If you're watching this on Facebook Live this Saturday at the Autobarn Mazda in Evanston, a live recording of Carcon Carne. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to be inside a 2019 CX-5 in the showroom That's on awesome. the floor. That's so awesome. <laughs> We have two live performances happening that day. Hi Ho, which is Jillian McGee of the Chicago band Turnspit, will be performing live. Also, the band Outrageous, a handful of members of that band, will be bringing instruments into a CX-5, <laughs> performing live as we record the podcast. Come out and hang out. It's really it's open to all. That is Saturday at Autobahn Mazda of Evanston. And uh, the CX-5 has the iActive all-wheel drive. It's standard for all the 2019 CX-5s. Uh, so is Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. There we are. Let's eat some food. Let's do it. Okay. It's car con carne. Let's eat in the car. It's car con carne. And now here's the star of our show. James Van Ostal. What do you want to start with? Uh, everything. Well, okay, so Mike back there is the editor of Food Editor, and one of the restaurants that is included in the Food Editor 99 is Kimsky, and he describes the restaurant as a counter-service Korean-Polish street food joint helmed by you. That's me. Chef Juan Kim. Uh, Kimsky is a modernist beer hall combining craft brews, including their own Mars beers. They have a tap room not far away. Where is the tap room? Uh, the Mars tap room? Yeah. Oh, it's like a mile and a half. Uh, south and a little, little west. Okay, uh, with Hardy Copo Fair. Did you make up Copo? Is that really uh, a thing? Ed and I did. Yeah. Okay. So my business partner Ed, who also runs a tap room, and the gallery down the street, uh, Co Prosperity Sphere, uh, which is literally down the street, uh, he came up with it. We're kind of like tired of saying Korean Polish, Korean Polish, Korean Polish. So we're just like, what are the first two letters of each culture? Co and Po. Let's just go with that. It's way easier. Again, I'm adjusting the phone here. You don't need to all of I want to make sure I get you in half. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Hardy Copo Fair. It's the kind of unpretentious cross cultural good time with a beer and an egg on it that you can only have in Chicago. I believe that's true. And I was explaining Kimsky to friends today, saying I was going there. There's This is so Chicago. Only in Chicago could this exist. <laughs> I, if I were to go to Oklahoma City and look for this, I wouldn't find it. Yeah, I wouldn't trust it either. If you no. found it in Oklahoma City, uh, that would be the last place I would trust anybody to make Korean or Polish food or the hybrid thereof. So let's talk about the hybrid. I would say unprecedented, the Korean-Polish. Where does that come from? Is it your your upbringing? Is... Uh, no, absolutely not. My upbringing is 100% Korean. It's actually Ed and Mike, the, the sons, of Maria, who's actually working. I saw her. And still working. Yeah, she's, she's still checking IDs and giving us life lessons uh, <laughs> as she sells the cigarettes. And uh, <laughs> she is uh, the matriarch of the whole operation. And uh, her sons are Korean and Polish. And they used to run a industry Monday night thing mm -hmm. where um, they would just have like shitty po Polish sausages, packaged Polish sausages, jar of kimchi with some mustard. And you know, if you buy if you buy like a PBR, you get like a, a Polish sausage with some with some stinky fucking cabbage on it, <laughs> and that was like a thing, you know. And I would come down and I would partake in the Monday evenings and have a good time, and um, it just kind of took off from there. Other chefs would offer, you know, making their own kraut or making their own cabbage, making their own kimchi, making their own mustard, making their own sausage, even. Um, I kind of came through and said, well, I'm, I hate seeing freeloaders and I want to just control how people take free shit and did like a fake plate up of a Polish, like a soigne Polish sausage plate. And they kind of had an idea and they already had the expansion planned and they just kind of 
asked me several times. I said no many times. <laughs> and then in a moment of weakness, a.k.a. when I was probably pretty wasted, mm-hmm. uh, as I typically used to do there, um, I said yes. And here we are. <laughs> no, you're, not, you're not wasted now. No. Absolutely. Although there was a, a pre-podcast shot. Yeah, there was a pre-podcast shot, but that was more for seeing friends shot mm-hmm. out of a small ramekin that's measured exactly one and a half ounces. Right. So if it's regulated, I can definitely make sure that, you know, I'm on the up and up. If it's regulated. Yeah. I do well, want to say regulated. hi to Chef Ben Randall, who's watching. Thank you, Chef. What up, Ben? For watching. A little Chef solidarity there, one chef to another. Nice. Watching you. I like how it's together. Hi, ben. Like... It's a Chef Ben. There's no separation of Chef or Ben. Sorry. Uh, so I interviewed Ben at the Reader. Oh, did you really? Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah, he's a, he's a really good dude and a talented dude, too. That's awesome. Uh, so walking into this place, Kimski, from the street, you'd never guess what was happening in there. <laughs> Some people think uh, it's like an art gallery. Uh, you would never guess. I mean, it looks I, like a fucking skateboard ramp to me. <laughs> when, I saw the, when I saw the design... I just didn't know what to expect. I, you know, we wanted something cool and something modernist, uh, you know. But you know, we still want to be of the community. But Ed's pretty artsy, dude. He's the idea guy. Um, it's 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 a great family dynamic with between him and his brother, because his brother is so like, let's just get it done, Ed. Like, why are you, why do you need these kind of things or that kind of thing? And it's like because it'll be different from other things and. You know, you know the artist mind, the creative mind. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of, it just kind of goes off and does its own thing. But then it takes someone with logistical skills to be like, well, how the fuck are you gonna put one thousand panels of bleached wood onto this thing and expose it to the elements? You know. So what we have now is, <laughs> I didn't even want the name on the door, honestly. I everything was wait, like, wait, wait. is the name on the door? I don't, I don't yeah, think I, okay. we decided to put that in like a month later. When okay. people were just, they were like birds, you know, with like a clear window. Mm-hmm. They were just running their heads into the <laughs> fucking windows. We we're like, okay, we got to put something. Yeah, yeah. We got a sparrow you know? special yeah. tonight, guys. <laughs> yeah. All right, so Chef Ben Randall, who we acknowledged, uh, mentioned something that I wanted to mention. These new Kimsky shirts. Oh, no, Can this you, is, can this you like, is, lean into the camera yeah, somehow? So this is not a Kimsky shirt by any means because we wouldn't promote swear words. But this is, uh, I made this shirt randomly after, I, man, there's been a lot of, you know, terrible Yelp reviews and people kind of taking that platform and thinking they have control over small businesses. And, you know, my thresh, I've, I'm used to bad reviews. I don't give a shit about Yelp. But when people fabricate stories to the point where there's other witnesses that say that shit didn't happen and they still put it out there for the world to, technically the world to read, mm-hmm. it really angers me and aggravates me. Sure. So this happened with uh, Cafe Mary Jean with uh, Chef Mike Simmons. And, you know, he was looking out for one of his employees, a female employee. And basically the short story is that someone made an inappropriate comment and he just asked him kindly to leave. And he put up a big, big stink, but he turned it around and made it seem like the chef was crazy. And I know Mike personally, and I know he wouldn't do that. He's going through uh, some personal stuff, so I know he wouldn't do anything you know, to that degree that this Yelp reviewer said. And I also follow this guy, Brad Bolt, who owns Neon Wilderness and a couple other bars. And his Yelp retorts are just fantastic. It's like, it's like, ah, I just want to eat more of it. So <laughs> those things combined recently, I just kind of felt compelled to write, fuck Yelp. <laughs> and you suck too, because it's not credible to me. You know what I mean? There's guys like Michael in the back seat here, who should be in the front, honestly, my bad. Um, I like having a tiny little head on Facebook. I like your lean, too. It's yeah. fucking sexy. Uh, <laughs> now, Mike's been sitting shotgun for the past yeah. two years. So, Yeah, I just Rosa parked him. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. wow. you know, I just kind of... <laughs> wow. Sorry. Let my people go. Yeah, this has nothing to do with the shot. Uh, this is me normal. So, uh, yeah, so I just kind of felt compelled to just make these shirts real quick for my industry friends and just be like, you know what? We can fight back, too, and we can go against this tyrannical fucking website that's been profitable for years yeah um they just recently put out a report that said they're gonna shutter soon which is fantastic i didn't read that yeah, nope. yeah it's gonna happen soon uh their stocks plummeted huh because there's too many elites yeah. they're literally going to business i they've tried to threaten me and, and with their elite status and, and say shit like you know we we're influencers and we have hmm. this x amount of power i'm like bitch you work in a fucking cubicle 
<laughs> or you work at your, or you live in your mom's basement. You are fucking nobody to me. I don't give a shit. I don't get to go to your job and critique your twenty minutes of performance in an office when you're trying to cut yourself. You know what I mean? Like that. I, if I don't get to do that, it's not fair that you get to do that to me. And, and this you just speaks mean? to a universal truth: never read the comments. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but. They are fun sometimes to troll, but sometimes it's just, it gets overwhelming, you know? I, I, I learned this lesson years ago, working in radio, doing nights at Q101. I would get these horrible, just awful emails telling me all the unspeakable things I should do to my mother and just terrible, like, death threats and stuff. And I would go home and yes, I'd be... Yes, Ben. Sorry. I would go home agitated and just worked up and shit, I got to respond to that. And then when I realized that I... I just let it go and not respond. It was the most liberating feeling in the world. Like I used to be like that. I have moments of that. I honestly do. 90% of the time I do. But some people need to be called out. They just, they shouldn't be able to say whatever the fuck they want with no, mm -hmm. with no like retraction or no kind of like ownership to that comment. Cause they, all they do is, is shrivel when you call them out. Mm -hmm. I'm like you were so bold and brave before. Why is it that when someone calls you out, you all, all of a sudden retract and say that it's our fault. And it's, it's like our response. It's our responsibility to just listen. I'm like, no, go fuck yourself. <laughs> and there's the headline for this week's episode. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Gfy. Well, it's interesting with with Yelp for me. Uh, you know, everybody says, "Oh, you must hate Yelp because they're all stupid." It's like, well, they are all stupid. There's no there's no question of that. But I use it to look for information sometimes, mm -hmm. and particularly yes. Chinatown. It's great for Chinatown because you get actual Chinese Americans going on there and talking about it. You know, there'll be 18 reviews that say, "Well, I eat at PF Chang a lot, so I really know my <laughs> Chinese food." But you know, there will be people who actually say, "Oh yeah, you can get the Lao Mao Ching Pao, you know, whatever." The way Mom used to make it when we lived in Hong Kong, you know, then I know something to actually go order there, and I'm not just ordering. Yeah. Uh, you know, pot stickers. I'm, I'm literally just really calling out like the guys that are like, oh, uh, you know, they start their reviews with like it was raining and like, <laughs> I really felt the clouds and there was like an energy out there. I'm like, no, there <laughs> fucking wasn't. It was Tuesday. You came in at 4:42 and I told you to get the fuck out because we're closed and you're stupid as fuck for not reading a sign or googling this shit. You're a fucking adult. There's no way you couldn't see that we were closed. There's four closed signs and the doors closed. Why would you? Like, come on, you know. That's I know. Just, those are my. That's just what I'm complaining. Complaining against. Sorry. I'm kind of stressed out sitting next to you tonight. <laughs> Don't be stressed out. No, this is. I want you to feel comfortable. I'm a little. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank God the camera's on way down. You know. That's what I'm right. Yeah. Uh, Epic Deli says, "Hey guys, Epic hey. Deli." Uh, if you look on a map, they are geographically on the other side of the planet from where we are right now in Bridgeport. Oh, nice. so uh, but one Park. Of my, <laughs> keep going. Uh, one of my favorite places on Earth, Epic it's Deli. Also uh, or something. I'm, I'm assuming that is uh, Tyler Wildey, proprietor. Uh, who no, where I are they? Door. Really? McHenry. McHenry. Yeah. Oh, that is not so go close. north and keep going. Yeah. 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 Hit I, the tri-state. Keep going. <laughs> Past Libertyville. Keep yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wisconsin border. More or yeah. less. Yeah. Hour yeah. 15 minutes away from here. Yeah. And, yeah. At this time of day. These are, these are parts of the world that I haven't been to since my kids grew out of whatever museum is near there. You know, those days we There's were, a train museum up there. The train, well, oh, we know the train museum well. We saw Thomas at the train museum many times. The Volo Auto Museum, museum is out there. Yeah. Oh, is it really? Which is a delight. They've got a classic drive in theater. Wow. Can't find those in many places anymore. I digress. Let's talk about the yeah, food because we've got food sorry sitting on the that. dashboard. We'll talk more about the man. restaurant. We'll talk a lot about the food at her 99 sure. for 2019. But I, it would be a crime and a sin to let this food just get cool as we're talking oh, here. No, it's all good. These uh, biodegradable things that we overpay for, they keep this shit hot. Okay. <laughs> it's so expensive. <laughs> so, all right, Chef Juan, you are yeah. our guide. Yeah. So uh, let's go through this buffet. So we have here uh, the Maria Standard. This is what kind. This is our re modern interpretation of what started the whole story the whole dialogue with korean polish you know your classic uh kielbasa style polish sausage it's our recipe but uh Mikowski down the street makes it for us the the queen sausage of chicago mm -hmm. the new a pro man um <laughs> so uh we make our own kraut uh, it's our own recipe that uh co-op uh makes up north for us uh we went through a lot of koji starter went through a lot of red cabbage Went through a lot of recipe tasting, and we decided to come. This is our final uh, kraut. Uh, the bun is from Spoken Bird in Pilsen. Uh, we make our own soju mustard. Wow. Um, uh, st uh, steep the seeds in some soju. Cook it with the cook it down. And, and what is soju? Uh, soju is basically Korean vodka. 
Okay. It's like a spirit. It's a distilled spirit. Usually made with sweet potatoes or rice. Okay, this sounds delicious already. Oh, it's awesome. Uh, it's very dangerous as well. Um, <laughs> and then next to that is one of our specials today. We have a lot, a lot of daily specials. Uh, we decided to go 100% Polish today. We did, we have our own rendition of uh, gawankis, which are basically Polish cabbage rolls uh, with a meat chili sauce. Uh, next to that is our kopika. This is on our winter menu. It's basically Polish dumplings, uh, kind of reminiscent of gnocchis, mm-hmm. uh, potato, uh, flour, egg, um, handmade, uh, blanched, and then uh, refried. Uh, refired, I should say, uh, with a bunch of fennel, uh, confit fennel, uh, pickle fennel, fennel butter sauce. We have our classic wings. This is one of our most popular uh, menu items. So uh, as we were waiting yeah. to, to come out here, a guy walked in, a regular customer. He said, uh, I got to have the wings. Yeah. Had those last time. Yeah. Got to have those. Those were amazing. Yeah, they're fun. Okay. Uh, we smoke them. We get, a, we get the wings from a good source, and then uh, we smoke them first to kind of render some of the fat. Uh, get the skin nice and uh, crisp, uh, get a little flavor in there, and then we deep fry it again, and then we sauce them. Um, it's our own sauce that we make in-house, uh, rice vinegar based. And then what's the other shit? I forgot. Oh, the poutine. The poutine. Oh, the poutine. Uh, <laughs> you know, handcuff fries. Uh, we make uh, the kimchi that we have that we make in-house. We save the juice, and we make a gravy out of it. Um, and then we top it with uh, more uh, crumbled queso, uh, some pickled red onions, to cut through some of the richness and some scallions oh and all that shit. Mike, is your mouth watering? <laughs> He's I had the food plenty of times. I've had it, awesome. but I'm still. Yeah. Like, and then, uh, Can we open the food already? The, the, the curds. The curds are white cheddar, Wisconsin white cheddar cheese curds. Um, I don't know where you want to start. This is like. A um, I guess we'll start with the wings. So I'm going to hold this up for people watching on Facebook Live. These are. Oh, yeah. Those are the wings. And we got pierogi. Those right? are what actual wings should look like. They're not jumbo size because. Oh, the smell. They're oh. not full of steroids. And it's not fucking <laughs> weird. Yeah, I've smelled it so many times. I oh my goodness! Know to this shit. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna grab one. Yeah, please do, Mike. Certainly. Thank you. And then this is the the poutine. Uh, Everyone grabs a fork the, for the that. Pica. Yeah. So if you need forks, we got forks right so here. So this is fennel on top? Or no, that is uh, just scallions. Just scallions. Scallions okay. and sesame seeds. Hmm. And the sauce is um, sesame seed oil, some uh, fresh ginger, fresh garlic, some rice vinegar, honey. Um, you know, wings sometimes are like yeah. just like a hot blast, and these are really nice. There's just there's a lot going on here. They got heat, but it's it's mellowed out with different flavors. Yeah, we don't want to blow anyone's palate out. You know, like yeah. I, I've gone to some places unless like that's what we're known for. You know, like if you go to like uh, like a Szechuan peppercorn heavy place, like you know right. what to expect. You know, uh, with us, like we want to make sure we're palatable to a lot of tastes and a lot mm-hmm. of walks of life. Especially, you know, we want to serve the community, and they're used to kind of meat-heavy, um, centric things. So we want to make sure we adhere to some of those rules and, you know, kind of, you know, make sure we can be palatable to everyone, you know? And that was one of my questions, too. I mean, a place like this feels like it might be more at home near Wrigley Field as opposed yeah. to Sox Park. <laughs> That's funny because I actually live by Wrigley Field. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I, was a, I, was a, I was born a north side, <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, you know, like it's... Doesn't matter what part of the city you're in. I, honestly, like it's just, you know, th- th- this is food that's simple. We just, we just try to make it better. <laughs> I guess you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. We, we all, we all have good backgrounds uh, as far as our training goes with food. Can have you hand me in? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> and you know, we wanna, we still wanna abide by the rules of good food. You know, make everything from scratch, source as locally as possible. Try to get good organic wings. You know, make sure a protein source is good, mm-hmm. uh, things of that nature, and still be affordable to the neighborhood. You know, I think a lot of times uh, a lot of restaurants get not faulted, but they get blamed for higher prices. But it's like what a lot of people don't realize is that we get, you know, we got to pay the farmers. We got to pay the local yeah. guys. We got to pay all these guys, you know, for their for their services and stuff. So we're, we're trying to be that crossroad, you know. I think that's what's really one of the things that's so great about Chicago dining right now though is you've got guys who are concerned with all those things and they're still making twelve dollar things. Right. You know, it's not you know, maybe it's a couple bucks more than it would be, you know, to get wings at at whatever bar that takes Mm -hmm. them out of frozen out of a bag. But it's really good food that is at a you know, very reasonable I have that and some beer kind of price. Mm-hmm. And you know the amount of care that goes in that stuff. That's that's you know if I do this book for any reason, that's why it's because I love those kind of places, and we've got them all over the city, and 
you know, that's that's just, it's a beautiful thing. So this is what we call a reset in radio. If you're just joining us on Facebook Live, that's Mike Gebert in the back seat. He is the creator, editor, and man behind the Food Editor website and the Food Editor 99, the annual uh, review of Chicago restaurants. That right there is Chef Juan from Kimsky. Oh, hey. We're eating his food. And Mike said it. We're eating the wings. Uh, he said it beautifully. Wings are, sometimes are just hot for their own sake, and that's just your takeaway. My first bite of that wing, holy shit, there was just so much going on. I made you swear. That's great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I did my job. Just, it, it was complex. And there were flavors I didn't instantly recognize in there, too. Well, that's great. Uh, I mean, honestly, like, this is this is my upbr- upbringing in that sauce. And I remember I asked my mom how to make, you know, the classic, you know, you know what wings I'm talking about? I actually don't know how to say it in Korean, but it's like the Korean-style wings. They're very uh, sticky, mm-hmm. uh, heavy, uh, heavy on the the sweetness. And I, growing up, I hated the sticky. I just yeah. don't like sticky yeah. anything. <laughs> so um, I try to incorporate some of those flavors, but not, but have my own twist on it. So it's not like every other Korean restaurant wings. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, I think part of the smoking, you know, that that kind of um, speaks well, to that. Well, that that flavor comes out instantly too. Yeah, good. That smoky taste. Good. That's yeah. that's delicious. Uh, so Mike, you're in the back seat. You're kind of at a, a deficit. Hi. As as you need stuff, ask for it and we'll we'll send it back. <laughs> yeah, open some more of this food. Dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, let's try the Copica. <laughs> okay. So these yeah, are our dumplings. Uh, we uh, we use double O flour. Uh, we use chipper back potatoes. Um, Thank we uh, make our own we make our own fennel stock to cook uh, right at, right on the line so that we can make the sauce. We use cold butter again, it's like our French method of adding cold cubes of butter to make a, a emulsified sauce in while in the pan cooking, and then we top it with some pickled fennel again to kind of uh, cut through the rich some of the richness. Um, but this is like a homey dish, you know. This is another Polish dish that's uh, common in a lot of the buffets and like some of the grocery stores you might go to. I'm trying to frequent. soak up all the butter right. I can. The more the merrier, uh-huh. honestly. And uh, again, these are principles that are, are applied in all cooking. You know, you got to have an acid to go balance the fat. You know, you got to have um, richness for saltiness. Uh, you know, fatties. You know, things like that. This, this is all things we think about, not just blowing out a palate or. Making mm-hmm. sure something tastes 100% Korean or 100% Polish. We're neither. You know what I mean? We kind of create our own genre of food. And it's not because we're, you know, we're trying to, like, change the, the food landscape. It's just this is the challenge that was posed to me. And I thought it would be fun to do it. And somehow it works. And well, I want to talk about that a little bit. Because yeah. I think that's one of the things that's, that's really cool on the scene is we have... A lot of second generation, people who are second generation in the restaurant business, or at least second generation in America. So they grew up eating eating the food that their parents had, but they also grew up exposed to American pop culture. And they don't want to open, you know, I think of like the Chinese place with the Zodiac menus, you know. <laughs> they don't want to open that place. They want to open a place that's more like American places. So You know why? Because we'll never be able to get as good as those Chinese Zodiac places. Like, we've eaten <laughs> there all, I mean, I've been eating at those places all my life, and I know sure. I can't make food like that. You know, if I, even if I wanted to, you know. I still remember as a kid growing up in Rogers Park, our big adventure as a family was going for Chinese food at Pekin House. Pekin House, I was just going to say. Devon Avenue, it's east be. of oh, Western yeah. Avenue. That was our thing. Zodiac menus, the, the what tea. What school whole... did you go to? Uh, Stone School. Oh, sure. You know, I went to Clinton and Boone. Okay. Those are my schools. I grew up off of Devon. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. But yeah, that was that was my big thrill. And that's what I think of when I think of those Zodiac menu restaurants is yeah. Pekin House from yeah. back in the day. I love that place. <laughs> Oh, so real quick. So this is the standard. This is what set it all off. This is the Polish sausage. Uh, we use uh, pork shoulder in our recipe. Um, <laughs> Here we go. And the kraut is uh, red cabbage that we make with uh, co-op. Um, sauce and bread up north. And it's we use a koji starter to speed up the uh, fermentation on it. My goodness. Is there a knife in there? I or think there just, is. Yeah, I just take it by we're all friends. Actually, there is <laughs> a knife. I want to be respectful. Yeah. So we change our menus up. Um, you know, we take, we add a few things, take off a few things, depending mm-hmm. on the season. Um, we just, we had cold noodles on the menu uh, in the summer. We had uh, a rice cakes, which is like commonly referred to as duck, mm-hmm. um, which is awesome. But um, yeah, you know, we just try to have fun with the food. Honestly, our daily specials, we just kind of flex our culinary muscle and just kind of do whatever the fuck we want. As uh, you should. <laughs> yeah, as we should. And then we started doing a four top thing. 
Oh, Tom Brooks says, I have dumpling envy. <laughs> You're not wrong, Tom. <laughs> Mike, do you need napkins? I'm good. Okay. I grab my You're own. not wrong. All right, let me grab some Polish. On paper, Kimsky sounds like it shouldn't work. On paper, yeah. In right. person, oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, it's all it's all the elements of, you know, a lot of immigrant cooking. It's salt, it's fat, uh-huh. and it's preservation, right? I mean, cabbages is, you know, salted cabbage and room temperature is used everywhere. Mm-hmm. Dumplings, you know, anything to make flour go the distance is used in every culture. You know, it's all about feeding the masses with, with, with little bits, you know? Well, I remember when you were first opening it, you know, you, you said that it's based on the fact that... Uh, Poles and Koreans have a shared love for uh, dumpling wrappers and pork. So pretty much, and yeah, and you know that's reflected in everything we do, right? I mean, <laughs> and then you add, you know, kimchi from one and sauerkraut from the other. Yep. I mean, mm-hmm. there's that fundamentally makes sense. not really from one mandu in the other. Yeah, um, sar, um pork belly. Just you know, I went to a I went to a Polish restaurant on the south side that's not there anymore called uh, Salza. Sal- mm-hmm. Salza. It was like a wood door. But they had pork fat as butter. For your, oh, as oh spread. yeah. Do you remember that place? Smolik, I think it's yeah, called. Yeah, it's it a was fucking move. awesome. And I'm like, that's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Yes, uh, I took my kids there and we squeezed into like nice. oh, like I a Santa you. Claus sleigh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and ate in that. Can we just talk about that sausage for one oh, more yeah, second? Oh, yeah, sure. I just wanted to show off the Van and White, the uh, yeah, cookies. Yeah, I appreciate right. that. Um, that was delicious. I Good, could eat I'm that every day. Like that's just. Please don't. You'll die. I will die. <laughs> That's a concern. That is. Yeah. Mike, what do you think of that? Oh, I love work it. in progress. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. All right. What, what, what's that? So I should try the poutine first. Oh yes. So this, this is, is the a, first thing when I walked in there. Chef Juan said, "Well, what, what do you guys want?" I'm like, "Poutine." Yeah. So when we uh, that came about because uh, I actually did poutine fest right before we opened, and a lot of people were like, "Is this going to be in the menu?" When poutine you guys fest is a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. It was a thing. It was at the chop shop. And people kept asking me, like, are you going to have this on the menu? It's really good. I'm like, no, because it's, it's Canadian. It's nothing to do with fucking Korea or Poland. Like, no. And then uh, one of my friends was like, dude, you got to put this on the menu. I'm like, I know it has nothing to do with either cultures, but, you know, you can make it sort of work that way. And I'm like, yeah, well, we could use kimchi. Potatoes are used in Poland. <laughs> A lot of potatoes are consumed. Onions, we could make it our own thing and make it work. Maybe this will be like the wild card on the menu. And we kind of interp- reinterpreted our own version of the poutine and just kind of ran with it. And it's been one of our most popular menu items. On James, James seems to have had a religious experience. I'm sorry, Mike. You get none of this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wow. It's fun, uh, right? I mean, and I, I like the heat. Yeah. It's enough to make that my eyes water. Yeah, but yeah. So, again, the, 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 the heat is balanced by the richness of the, put- of the cheese. Well, the cheese, I mean? yes. So it's all... It's all it all works. It's all relative, you know. Um, yeah, that's good drunk food too. Oh, Let's absolutely. Yeah. yeah, there's a there's a there's a really good beer bar attached to us, so that's part of us. So you know we gotta we gotta make sure our customers are well fed. Um, I also want to note that you know going off all this stuff, having been over for two and a half years, now we have some wiggle room to do fun things. We started doing this thing called a four, impromptu impromptu four top dinner. That one table that we have it was was a joke table. Uh huh. We didn't think anyone would sit there. Um, so we now we do this impromptu thing where we cook on the fly where I kind of put an Instagram message out there and people give me their ingredients and we I shop the day of and the day before <laughs> and we do a five course menu based off the people's ingredients that's hilarious yeah. you, you are your really own one man food network challenge yeah <laughs> I was on food network before too that's were you really scary. were you yes. that's the only way I know how to cook I only know how to cook when there's a lot of pressure on me like it's really weird <laughs> tell me about that what, what, what were you on I was on Cutthroat Kitchen three times, and then I was on some really shitty show with Amber Rell called uh, mm-hmm. Chef Wanted. Um, that was a stupid fucking train wreck. <laughs> and uh, fuck her, too. Uh, Wait, do we hold those up? Yeah. So, so these are the cabbage donkey. rolls? Yeah. Oh so that's a classic. That's another classic Polish dish, but uh, it's, again, it's reinterpreted in our own way. We used uh, just all beef this time. Uh at, in, in, we included not long grain rice, but like traditional Korean rice, like sushi, uh, sushi medium grain rice, in the mix, and then we kind of had some uh, Coney Island chili left over. Uh-huh. So we kind of just Get added out. a bunch of shit oh, to man. it. Our own beef chili sauce. Get with out. It. <laughs> so that's okay. what makes it. See, that's what's that's fun, got though. like yeah, diner got... two a.m. written yeah, exactly. all over. It. That's really good. But it's fun, and it's, you know we got the beef from Slagle. 
I get that same email that all the other fucking chefs get. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we, we, we pay the price, but, you know, I want to make sure that the community eats well and that they eat ingredients that can be traceable. So, like you know. The, the interesting thing about the cabbage roll, yeah, it's it's filled with meat, but the cabbage makes it feel like it's light and, yeah, and, not, and not doing something sinful. It's healthy. so evil. Uh-huh. It's so evil. It's like, my brain doesn't lie. know how to process what I'm eating right now. Because <laughs> it is eating vegetable, technically. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, it's just soaked in beef fat now. <laughs> you know, but you know, anywhere you go out to eat, it's gonna be a little unhealthy, and you know what I mean. Like that's that's the joy of eating out, right? It really is. That's why that's why books like this exist. Like the Fooder Ninety Nine. So much fun. Now available on Amazon. Now Correct. available on Amazon. Um, and at many fine independent bookstores, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I actually bought my copies off of Amazon, so yeah. it works. They're dangerous. Um, but yeah, Roscoe Books has it. Uh, Sparrow Coffee has it out in Naperville for people out there. Love it. Uh, other bookstores, Does I hope. Come with a fedora. <laughs> yeah, <Sorry>. really. Um, <laughs> I'm crying still from the food. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, it, it, every dish you brought out just has this complex range of flavors, and they're interesting. And I. It's left on my lips and tongue. Good. Oh my goodness! I want to be nostalgic for people too. I want I want like the home part out. That's where I learned initially. It was my mom, you know. So if it has that kind of feel, then I did my job. Well, the thing about any of these dishes, like I have it, and I think, well, I got to come back and see what else is on the menu. Yeah, because <laughs> it's, it's just Good. it's interesting enough and different enough and vibrant enough that I, I want to keep digging into that menu. Good. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank uh, this you. This is Mike's recommendation from Food Editor. I This is a slam dunk. Thanks, Mike. I, I love this food. Yeah, no, me too. I mean, I love that it represents what I think is so cool about the food scene right now in Chicago, this kind of fusion, this kind of second generation mixing it with, you know, sort of pop culture references. Um, you know, another thing, too, was it's interesting. I mean, this is – I redo a certain amount of the book every year, and this is one – when I first wrote about it, I think you had like four things on the menu or something. <laughs> and You're so terrified. I terrified. Yeah, so I knew I was going to have to come back because there'd be like eight more things yeah. by, by this year. So I did that. Awesome. Um, well, thank you. See, that's what a real journalist does. Right. That's, that's exactly <laughs> right. It's funny. Uh, a friend of mine, a new friend, just moved to Chicago, uh, lived in Michigan and Washington forever. He said, I want to get to know Chicago better. I, I, for someone who's visiting, never been here before, I know it's not taking them to see the Bean or Navy Pier. And I said, Oh, it's Cloudgate. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah forgive me. <laughs> I gotta correct you. I said, Well, you, you can't do much better than just touring restaurants. And like, Chicago is all about the neighborhoods. And this Absolutely. is this is this cool place in Bridgeport that really only locals would know about. I mean, it's. Uh, you know, and, and it's funny because most of our business comes from uh, visitors. Really? Uh, yeah. We, you know, as, as much as we want to be for the community, I think a lot of people are kind of setting their ways here. You know, and, you know, a lot of people go to, like, you know, the $5, 5 for $5 pork chop sandwiches. Uh-huh. And it's like, I can't wait, wait, beat hang on, that. that's a thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't beat that price point. That's amazing. <laughs> I want to get fucking five pork chop sandwiches or five bucks. Like, that's an amazing deal. I can't beat that. And it's and it's fine, you know. Like, again, you know, whether they, whether they come around now or three months from now or, you know, whether I give it away for free, you know, like, I just... You know, we're here for them. Yeah. And, you know, like, it's, it, it is fun to see all the people come in and just, is the, the wonderment. There's like, oh, we're in, hey, we're in Bridgeport. Oh, shit. It's like, hey, you're only four miles away from your house in the West Loop. It's not <laughs> yeah. that fucking exotic. Yeah. We have electricity here, too, dick. Um, yeah, I, I picture people <laughs> rolling through here, like, maybe from Naperville, oh, who, who bought food under no a Naperville. Clue. Who, who treat it like National Lampoon's vacation going through East St. Louis. You know, they, roll them up. The, the best question I get is, how does this work? I'm like, well, I take your money, you eat, and you get the fuck out. Like any other fucking restaurant. What do you mean? How does this work? Now, are yeah. you more conspicuously patient with people when this happens oh, no, in real life? Not. Okay. I don't give a shit. Uh, I'm so tired of dealing with people. That's why I hired other people that are prettier and way more tolerant. So back of houses may be yeah. a better place for you. Yeah, and, and it's funny because the back house is right where the front house. Yeah. <laughs> Again, interesting layout to the place. Yeah. It almost has like, like speakeasy vibe. Like you got to yeah, pass no, that's, the. That's, that's, that's part of the appeal. I feel like I feel like that's what makes it fun too. Is, uh, there's like this grumpy. There's like this fucking curmudgeon that's like, oh, don't ask me your stupid shit about the menu. Ugh. What do you mean? What's good on here? Everything's good. Boo. And then like you go into the back and you see this expansive, modern like. Just 
open canvas for beer yeah. and solid, amazing cocktails. Yeah, you have like 50 beers. Yeah, that's insane. It, it, really impressive. And it looks yeah. like people come here just to drink. They most definitely do. They <laughs> literally just come just we to drink. We are on the south side, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Fair um, enough. And, you know, we have all walks of life here, which is the beauty of it. And we have all price points. We have random shitty beer. We have random shitty shots. You know, we have $8, you know, barrel age, you know, shit that you know monkeys drink to like fucking you know alpaca urine fucking barrel aged you know berliner well, I, d- I did see that you carry uh 350 yeah. brewing beer yeah. a former guest on the show 350 yeah. out in Finley uh, awesome. park yeah absolutely um but yeah we have all kinds of beer you know we we definitely you know we're all about again just all walks of life just we just want people to have a good time honestly despite my persona at the restaurant like i really do just want you to have a good time just don't ask stupid tired questions be an adult I, honestly <laughs> eating the food is the good time that, that's yeah, it perfect this is just it. don't ask me about it all right so i want to keep the conversation going so what we're going to do uh, we're going to pause the facebook live Ooh, and we're going to go deep into food under 99 car con carne presented by the autobahn mazda of evanston uh, again this saturday if you're watching on facebook live come join me 2 p.m recording on the floor this is so meta we're recording in a car inside the autobahn mazda of evans no <laughs> sorry it's going to be amazing uh, <laughs> so again to recap kimski this, this food is tremendous I, I i'm anxious to turn the camera off so we can really make fools of ourselves <laughs> really get dirty with it get and face down at it. the reason why i'm even aware of kimski although i probably should have been already uh is that man in the back seat mike gebert editor of the food editor 99 he puts this out every year he he does this himself this is a, a fantastic volume of work and it is work there's a lot of stuff that goes into this uh it really is an indispensable i just reference neglect guide. my kids for like the month of october exactly oh, it's fine it's for the greater public that's yeah. right. uh really i mean food writing is hard to do i've said this for years mike's truly one of the best and uh, he just knows so much about not just the food that goes on the plates but the the workings of the scene the the trends everything going on i can't recommend food editor enough so amazon.com for that that's mike gebert chef juan uh, your food's amazing. Thank you. The whole podcast will be on Carcon Carne next week after the Christmas holiday. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. All right, let's talk about Food Editor. Food Editor. Here we go. I even brought Greatest notes. Greatest publication in the history of Chicago. <laughs> it, it's suck on, the most informative, suck on an Ernest Hemingway and Saul Bellow. That's right. Definitely the most informative, in my opinion. It, it's great. And uh, just to, I probably should have said this at the uh, onset of the podcast, Mike. Mike Gebert is the editor and publisher of Food Editor. He is a James Beard Foundation Award nominee and winner and a, quote, frequent radio podcast guest. And here we are. <laughs> here I we did are. a commercial once because uh, I worked in advertising, too. And at one point, I managed to get on screen a thing that said, as seen on TV. So while you're watching it on TV, it says, as seen on TV. <laughs> Amazing. All right, so... You say it in the book. Years from now, at least 30 or 40 of these reviews will probably be the same. Yeah, I mean, it's the restaurants age in different ways. I mean, mm-hmm. there are some I definitely want to come back year after year, especially when they're new. And I feel like year two for a place is going to be more interesting and they'll have their feet under them than year one. Mm-hmm. Then there are other places you can not go for 10 years and, you know, they don't they're not going to change. Um, I don't know. I think Kimsky is somewhere in between. I definitely wanted to see the menu expand, as I was pretty sure it would. Uh, but I wouldn't say the character of it has changed very much. I think it's just more of what it was. So that's good. You know, better to be more of what you were than less. <laughs> well, let's talk about the new. Let's talk about trends. You mentioned you know, next generation cooks and owners. The one thing that kept popping up to me as I read through the new edition, charcuterie. I, I, yeah, I thought we were past charcuterie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's it just kind of like became part of the background radar, maybe. Mm-hmm. I mean, offhand, I don't know who who has charcuterie. Some of them are places that have had it for several years. You know, Table Donkey and Stick has it, or whoever. Um, I'd have to look through and see. I don't. I don't remember typing that a lot, but uh, it, it but I believe to you. Me. Um, well, let's talk about Oreo. For those yeah. of us who don't go out to a lot of fine dining places. I mean, th- this is it That's for you. That's my favorite tasting menu in the city. It is. Okay. It's wonderful. Wait. For those of us who eat more fries and poutine than fine dining <laughs> food. Take your wife this year, man. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting. This is the third edition. The first two I really wanted to not put. I mean, Oriole has two Michelin yeah. stars. It's a couple hundred bucks per person to eat there. And I didn't want that kind of place to be number one. because I want. First of all, because everyone does that. I mean, uh-huh. anybody makes a list of the best restaurants in the city, I guarantee you. One, Alinea. Two, Oriole. Um, but beyond that... I wanted to just kind of make a point about creativity for 30 bucks to me matters more than, you know, a really fine experience for 200. Lots of people can tell you where to get that. Michelin mm-hmm. will tell you where to get that. Mobile Guide will tell you where to get that. Articles in airline magazines will tell you where to get that. So the first year I did Fat Rice as number one, which, you know, I mean, fantastic sort of weird asian fusion chinese from another galaxy kind of place uh and pretty reasonably priced the next year i did monteverde which is an italian restaurant but with some southern twinge to it and you know just uh a very very individual personal example of a of an italian restaurant again not that expensive mm-hmm. uh sarah grunberg who runs it you know used to work at spiaggia where it was like 200 bucks for dinner and now it's 60 bucks for dinner at her place so you know the first couple of years i i stress kind of mid-priced places this year i just thought you know screw it it's time to just recognize that oreo is expensive as it is it's just really a beautiful experience they're so nice it's very soothing i you know i compared to like a japanese ryokan which is like one of those Japanese inns where everything is very well balanced and calm and soothing and all of that. And it's, it is just kind of like that. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Get your, you know, get your extra money together. You know, say whatever, you know, take in that change jar and just go do that once a year. That's part of the experience here. But at the same time, I mean, that's really not the emphasis of the Food Under 99. I mean, I, it's, I stress it all over the place. And even in, like, the top ten, which does kind of skew toward fine dining yep. a bit, it's still, you know, a lot of them are pretty reasonably priced. Well, uh, you know, with that said, sorry to interrupt, but I kind of feel like that's part of what makes a publication like this great is that it. some people will ask and be like, well, what's some of the fancier places that, you know, that's out there that's great, you know? And you got to have that range and be, you know, like just because they're the, the top 10 or whatever doesn't doesn't change the fact that people are still going to want to know about them mm-hmm. and know what's exactly out there. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's important to have that well-roundedness of like, what are the fine dining places that people are talking about? What, what are the, and on the other end of it, what's like the mom and pop shop that I want to yeah. go try? And that's most of the book. With the same principles of food. Yeah. That's most of the book. But, I mean, that's really, it's always, you know, just a place that tries a little harder, does something a little more interesting, and it's all relative to that price. You know, the the place in Chinatown where 10 bucks spent is better than 10 bucks somewhere else is, you know, that's as good as being the fine dining place where $200 spent is is better than somewhere else. Sure. And and you said it, Chef. I, I may not go to Oriole. It sounds great, but maybe that's just, you know, in my current situation, maybe that's, that's a bit of a stretch. I just like knowing about it. I like, that's part of our cultural <laughs> identity is that, that awareness. I like knowing what the places to go are. So when that person comes from out of town and says, hey, you're a local, what's the, what's the best fine dining right. place? Oh, well, oh, yeah. or, I saw or, in or. Fooder and uh, you know, <laughs> Chef Juan said. I'm never going to go to Australia, but I want to know that it's there. I want to see what's right. out there. <laughs> exactly. You know I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, like today, I was getting around a truck, and then I saw those awful lights go off, and I'm pretty sure I got a ticket today. Oh. And, you know, <laughs> it's the kind of thing where it's like we put up with so much living in the city. Oh, yeah, I paid a million dollars for a crappy little wooden house that's you know about about the same size as its garage and stuff like that and you know you you put up with a lot to live here so you might as well take advantage of the great stuff i mean Uh, you know agree go eat you know go eat the interesting immigrant food go see the cso or venia you know lawn seats are 10 bucks uh you know go you know see it's see a bulls game whatever it is benefit from living in the big city because otherwise you should just move to sheboygan wisconsin and you'll have a great big house for the same money yeah what's the point of living in a city this large and not taking advantage of its resources 
um, or staying within your own like bubble. Like that's just you know yeah. that's that's so fucking boring. Agreed. Like whenever I w- whenever I went to New York uh, pre nine eleven. Or like heard about people that live there. They're always like, "Oh, Brooklyn, that's so far." I'm like, that's just a <laughs> yeah. fucking bridge. It's so <laughs> right. close. Like you're you're excommunicating a whole region that's right. within walking distance almost, just because you don't, because just because you're lazy. That's and it. Unadventurous. You know what I mean? That's it. It's really weird. And that's how this city is. Like people in Logan Square, like the the realtors, the developers came in and created this weird safe haven within their own neighborhoods. And it's like, well, why do you need to go anywhere? Look, you have a dry cleaner, you have a restaurant, you have a cool bar all in one strip. They're trying to turn this whole place into a suburb, yeah. which is why I love Bridgeport as it is right now. We don't have a lot of that. You know, you don't see a lot of new development here. But, you know, it's unfortunate. It's, you know, it'll probably happen. It's on its way. But for now, it's it has its own character. It's like, it reminds, it's the closest thing to old Chicago growing up here that I have. You know, I, so there, there's, I want to tell you a story about the first time I came to Kimski. For some reason, I mean, explain this, I don't know. I decided it would be good to take the Ashland bus and have to walk, <laughs> Why? you know, have to walk half a mile from there and spend like 45 minutes, you know, getting here and all that. Yeah. So I'm walking through the neighborhood and I pass this one house and there's like, all of a sudden the smell i think she was like frying tripe or something like that it was like Oof, this that is a distinct deep, smell my friend deep funky you know That's hills intestinal. of sicily kind of you know italian food smell coming That's out of there roll, I'd say. yeah yeah <laughs> and it's like it's it's a little scary but at the same time i'm like oh my god there's like a whole sicilian village in this lady's basement you know mm-hmm. in her kitchen <laughs> and and i will never know it this is as close as I'm going to get to it, but it's just good to know that it's there. Absolutely, that the city of Chicago has this. When you said it, Chef, people just need to get out. It's, I'm a White Sox fan. I love going to see games here, and the pushback I always get from my friends is, "Oh, getting there is such a pain in the ass." In reality, even else. if you live on the north side, getting to Sox Park is actually easier. It's right off the expressway. Oh, it's so yeah. close. And and there's just parking. As easy as Wrigley. I think it's way easier. Yeah. If, if you're in a car, oh, yeah. it's much closer. Yeah. And you can park. Yeah. Right. But it's just that perception. Anything south of Congress Parkway. I mean, is, but who's responsible for that, right? right. I mean, who, who, who's been telling these people that, like, you don't want to go past Roosevelt? Uh huh. Exactly. You know? Right. I was like, called Roosevelt Wall the Street. Berlin Wall. Yeah. Because you didn't dare go. Right. And that's hilarious. You know, it's it's just crazy, and it's it's one of the things that's so great that these areas are. I mean, there are places I I would go to Johnny O's down the street and oh, get man. you know get a mother in law or that or fucking a pizza puff over there, bread a breaded steak sandwich or whatever. Love but it's a, a it's a kind of sandwich. scary place. You know, it's it's the kind of place where. You know, probably a couple of times somebody's tried to rob it, and the and the guy has just pulled out his shotgun and gunned but, them down or something. But, but at the same time, Southsiders are just as guilty though, because I know a lot of Bridgeporters won't go up north. Yeah. And if right. I have an event up north or something, and I'm like, hey, I need, I need some of you guys to come and support, you know, whatever, just you know, show them what's up. They'll just kind of be like, I don't know, man. That's like, that's like what six whole miles? I commute, yeah. <laughs> I commute ten and a half every day, dickhole. Like just fucking get on the bus. <laughs> are you are you over twenty five? You are. <laughs> <laughs> right. What the fuck is your problem? Are well, you, I, yeah. this is a car con carne first. I believe that was the first time Dick Hole was used on the podcast. So. <laughs> ding, 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 yeah. ding, ding. <laughs> You're welcome. And now a bonus round. Yeah, sh- show Chef what he won. <laughs> uh, all right, so jumping back into Food Editor, uh, talking about some of the repeat visits, how many times... You, I'm assuming you had to go out to eat at least 99 times in 2018. <laughs> <laughs> well, some things I carry over. And again, it's like, how often do you have to... To change it, um, some places I feel you know I feel fine about a review that I wrote three years ago. I know that they're stable. I mean, I, I said in some somewhere I said you know it's like Manny's. You could not go to Manny's for ten years, and Manny's would be Manny's. That's the a day great example. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but generally two three years I check them out again. Um, you know, I go to a lot of places that just don't make it. And it's really sad. November is kind of depressing for my family because I'll be like, there's this place that just opened and it might be great. <laughs> oh, it's not great at all. Uh-huh. So, you know, we, we go through a certain amount of that. But this year, I, I mean, I was adding them real close to the end. I mean, it's always something close to the end and I just have to cut it off. But, like, there's this place on the north side called Phenom Coffee. 
that for some reason is a coffee house slash Hungarian restaurant. And the guys aren't even Hungarian. They're like Puerto Rican. <laughs> so I don't, I don't understand this place, but it's totally charming. And it's like great. I mean, we don't have Hungarian food anyway for some reason. So it's got food that no one else has. It's, mm-hmm. it's like sweet. It's got like used books that you can, you know, buy for a Love buck it. off of them. It's in a historical building that, just it used to barely. be a rub and tug place, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Where, where, where is this? It used to be called Land and Touch. It's on Irving, just past like the first <laughs> building not torn down for the Ken- for the Kennedy there. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, they left the words, you know, what massage room number two Land on one of the touch. doors. No or way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Also it has a wall painted by someone sitting next to you. Yeah, oh, because you're a graffiti artist. <laughs> God, I forgot that. Yeah. Well, Ooh. you're all over the place. You're in Taco Bell uh, for crying out loud. I should. Yeah, I should die. Yeah, you, you're a busy dude. Uh, staying on the re- repeat um, restaurants real quick. Uh, Five Loaves in Greater Grand Crossing. I don't know this place. Nicest restaurant in that area? Um, as I attempt to talk through poutine here. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, I mean, kind of a soul food place, but in Chicago, soul food usually seems to be in a cafeteria. Uh-huh. And they're not a cafeteria. They make stuff fresh. But they're just these, you know, it's run by this sweet lady, and it was her sister, although she, the sister, has now gone on to do something else, and you know, whatever kids from the neighborhood that she's like a second mom to, and they're just all so nice, and they're, they're, you know, they have like good food that just makes you happy, and you go in there on Saturday or Sunday, and it's full of church ladies in their, you know, fancy dress. I love I mean, that. I, you know what, what? So many of these places are about is just. It's not just that there's the food there, um, but you get a whole sense of other people's lives. Yeah. You know, you, you're just walking in. You know, you're walking into their movie basically, and it's going on all around you, and that's great. Um, and I interviewed her, and, and you know, she say, "Yeah," and they they're, they're, they always want to give me a hug. Like, all I do is hug people all day. I'm like, well, honestly, I can see why. You know, it's like, <laughs> if I was depressed, I would drive here and get a hug. And for so, the record, Chef Juan, not hugging anybody. Yeah, I'm not. Anytime soon. I'm not. Just my girlfriend. No one wants a hug from you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And right, let me give you poutine back because I, I want it to go away. Thank when you, you talk about <laughs> restaurants that you know will be consistent year, two, one year, two years, three years from now, uh, is Duck Inn in that category? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and there's a guy, grew up on Bridgeport. Um, Duck Inn is in a building that he used to, you know, when he was like 10, his dad would send him over to get cigarettes and beer for him from this place, you know. So he, and then if he, like, stayed too long and played, you know, asteroids on the machine, the dad would call up and say, where's my goddamn kid? Um, More importantly, where are my cigarettes? Yeah, where yeah. are my cigarettes? Um but yeah, I mean, and so he took over this place, and he's a he's a chef who worked in fancy places all around the world. He worked for Four Seasons and and uh, whichever other big hotel chain is is attached to the Four Seasons, I forget. Um, but then he just wanted to open a place in his neighborhood, and similar to this, I mean, he actually gets sausage made at the same place you do, McKesky, mm-hmm. um, and it's just you know, it's like. Fat guy, happy food is huh. probably the you know the best way. And he's honestly, one of the nicest people. Yeah, yeah. Chef Hickey is super down to earth and nice, um, and uh, he's just again, he's just one of those another neighbor person that just wants people to honestly just have a good time and eat good food. I mean, it's really just as simple as that sometimes, you know. So let's talk about some of the new restaurants. Uh, I'll just have you kind of riff quickly on some of the things that caught my eye, uh, and you could talk about stuff that you think is worth noting too. Um, Smack Dab, which is I used to live at sixty-seven forty-two North Lakewood in Rogers Park. Uh, I wish this existed when I was over there. Yeah, it's in a strip mall that you probably mainly notice for having a McDonald's on Clark Street, and it's just the most adorably woke cafe. You know, everything is, you know, everything is gender neutral and. <laughs> You know, flower powery and all, and did all that. Did you say woke? He I did. did. I, I was going to call him on it, and I'm like, that's not that's not cool of me. Is um, it so young? Is it fire? <laughs> is it what? Is, is it, it fire? Is it is lit? It lit fam? Yeah. Is it lit AF? Is right. it lit fam bo? I, I can see my son making fun of me now. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I mean, it's just cute. It's up. It's up near university. It feels very much like something you see in a college town. Yeah. Again. Another life that you can go walk into for 45 minutes and experience and just, you know, get a, get a little piece of that. 
the Tempesta Market in West Town. Ah, oh, yeah. These guys are great. So, oh, again, so a second-generation guy. His parents have a longtime Italian restaurant on the west side, uh, Ristorante Agostino. And he went to work for places like Public and Quality Meats and so on and decided to make first Enduya, which is, this is kind of weird, a spreadable Sicilian salami. Now, spreadable and salami don't sound like they go together, <laughs> but it's kind of soft like butter. That would be due to oh. its incredibly high fat content. Yeah. And it's also, it's full of Calabrian chili, so it's bright orange and spicy as heck. And that sounds amazing. So That's he started so making good. that. that and there's amazing. just like, you go in there and there's just like a big blob of it sitting on the counter that you could go, you know, stab <laughs> and take a piece of. But um, so he now makes, I don't know, like 20, 30 kinds of sausage, brings in other sauce, salami from salumi, as they say now, uh, from, from other people in the area. And really, it's kind of like he opened a restaurant to be his demo place for when he brings in chefs to, to you know, who might want him to make something for them, you know, so, but, but you can go there and have a sandwich of it. And you're getting a great deal when you get one because if he charged someone else wholesale and they put it on a sandwich, it'd be like a $30 sandwich, yeah. but he just piles it on and, and you know, they're, they're so good. I mean, they're really, they're, you know, they're not just sandwiches. They're kind of conceived like dishes. There's a balance to how things are put together. That's, that that's eggplant really nice. is magical. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? That's I don't know why you'd be eating a vegetable in there, Jesus. but uh, you can. And it's so good. Yeah. This was one of the reviews in the new food editor that jumped out at me and I thought, oh, this is <laughs> a place I need to know. That I place to- is magical. Yeah. <laughs> that man knows how to fucking touch sausages. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You mentioned an Indian place that is not actually on Devon Avenue, uh, not far from Devon Avenue, technically, uh, Mango Pickle. I've driven by there a million times, and I, I just didn't think about it until I read Fooditor. Yeah, it's, uh, again, it's sort of like something you'd see in a college town. It's got that sort of, um, you know, just relaxed, slightly hip, but not too expensive feel. And then, also, I mean, the, the cook is not actually Indian. Her husband is. So it's got a little bit of this that. This is a trend. Yeah. Well, it's got a little bit of that that thing that you see in college towns a lot where, you know, I'm not from this, but I read a book about it once. And sometimes that's good and sometimes it's pretty bad. You know, if you go in a place and it's mostly burritos, but then they have like one Indonesian stir fry, don't get the Indonesian <laughs> stir fry. He doesn't know what he's doing. Um, so this has a little of that flavor and it sounds like I'm slamming it, but it, it pulls it off pretty well. And it's just something different. I mean, Devon is a little monotonous sometimes, more than a little maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the most interesting Indian places right now, the real action is out in Schaumburg and places like that. Is that real? Because a lot of, you know, because Indians, Indians are all doctors in case you haven't noticed. (laughs) And they all moved, they all moved. And they all moved to Schaumburg. I I think of chain restaurants when I think of Schaumburg, but I guess. This is the other, the other universe out there. Well, that's actually one of the things I really like about the suburbs is there's usually the alternative alternative universe right there i mean like if you're out in the western suburbs you drive on butterfield road it's every chain yeah. known to man and yet there's great chinese food out there you just have to get off butterfield road right. and go hunt it up there's that good korean sense. restaurants uh, all over the suburbs yeah I niles mean, and and uh northbrook Mort- morton grove Glenview. i believe yeah, i believe yeah. niles and morton grove because i went to grade school and middle school and high school in skokie and huge korean population yeah. And I, I think that population still is there. And they want to eat flavors of home. So yeah, what do they sure. do? You know, like uh, someone's going to open a restaurant and be that be that guide for them. <laughs> same with Indian food and same with a lot of Polish food even. Yeah. Well, let's stay on uh, new restaurants from um, Food Editor 99 for uh, another moment or two. What were some things that were new to you, Mike, this year that you thought, oh, wow, I'm so excited to put this in print? Um. I mean, again, a lot of these, a lot of these second generation places. I love that, you know, they're doing this this mix of flavors. In some ways, it makes it more accessible to people. There's a really good example of that with Korean, um, kind of mid scale restaurant called Passaroto, which is an Italian name. Every time you mention a restaurant, Chef Juan is like, I've excited. eaten there. Yeah, I know all those places. <laughs> they're all really good. So she calls it a Italian Korean restaurant. But it's not like Copo here. It's not the no. same way. It's more just kind of an Italian spirit of, 
you know, we're, we're just going to all come together and have this big, warm, accessible meal that anybody, Italian or not, can have. And the most, I mean, the most, the easiest to under, understand example, you mentioned like duck bouquet earlier, which is sort of spongy um, rice cakes. And she uses them like gnocchi. And but then serves them with like a lamb ragu, which is pretty Ooh. Italian. And so you've got the the Korean texture and the Italian flavor sort of mixing together. And that that's a fantastic dish. That was it's rare because I want to try as many things as possible. It's very rare that I say, oh, man, these are so good. We need another one of those. <laughs> and we got another one of those the first time I went. Here's the interesting thing. We ate delicious food from Kimsky at the beginning of the podcast. We're still kind of nibbling at it. Should be full, but as we're having this conversation, I'm, I'm <laughs> you're like hearing, ready to go. Either right? five more places. I'm hearing these descriptions. I'm like, oh shit, I, I'm ready for more. The, <laughs> the tap is on. Let this flow. I mean, all those places you mentioned, they're, they're really all just so good, and like you know, they have they have the the mindset of keeping the principles of like just good food, you know, and that's like a lot of places, chain restaurants don't have that. They don't think. About like, oh, maybe we should just make our own shit. Why are we (laughs) ripping open this fucking bag when we could just... We have all the stuff down the street at a grocery store even. Let's just make it, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and it's one of the things that's really interesting is how fusion... I mean, fusion was a bad word. And the chefs still call it, you know, the F word. Because it meant, you know... Let's add Cajun flavors to our pasta, and then it's <laughs> it's close to March 17th, so let's throw some corned beef in there, too. And, you know... Um, and it was just crap. And a lot of times in, in Asian food, what it meant was we're sugaring it up for the white people. And it's it's more expensive and lamer than if you went to an actual Chinese or Korean whatever Kung restaurant. Kung Pao chicken. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Although I got to admit. It's pretty good. I'm, I'm never <laughs> sorry when I'm somewhere that my best choice is Panda Express. Oh, you know? <laughs> that is just like, you might as well just put some fucking Jolly Ranchers in your mouth. <laughs> and and just like, you suck a packet of fucking soy sauce with the Jolly Ranchers. <laughs> that's Panda and just eat a spoonful of rice. But that's the thing. I mean, it's so much as, it's just, so, they had so much sugar to it. And the yeah. good example of that is like, go have Pad Thai in a real Thai restaurant and have it in an American restaurant and it's just that's where you'll taste how much more sugar is in the American mm. version yeah um, so anyway so, so but, an, but another now I think people are just doing fusion in a more interesting way I mean the, the Passerado dish or whatever those are, or the Copo or, or things like that it's like how do we balance you know a little my heritage here and a little from somewhere else same like Bi and Co yeah, a buy and co, a new Filipino Cuban place. Again, the you know pork is the uniting factor between yeah. different cultures. So pork brings us together. Yes, I also painted that restaurant, but no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Footer ninety nine again available on Amazon. If, if you're from Chicago, if you're visiting Chicago, this is an indispensable guide. Uh, at the back of the book, the classics, the the ones that you're always asked about, Mike. That you had to find a home for. Yeah, it's, you know, it just became one of those things where I kind of felt like, what can I do to encourage people to buy the new edition each time? Because it doesn't completely flip over. Mm-hmm. And last time I did, like, what are my favorite neighborhood Mexican places? Mm-hmm. And this time I thought, I mean, I, I do get the question, well, is Johnny's Beef in there? Is Calumet Fisheries in there? It's like, no, you already know they exist. You don't need me to tell you they exist. But I went through and I thought, well, sure, I'll do that once. I'll do the classics and cover off you know so Pequod's pizza gets in there and Vito and Nick's pizza gets in there for a different style of pizza and um lens what all is in there but yeah I mean just kind of those classic Chicago things that you're going to have once in a while I mean I'm not I'm not really telling you when it's Tuesday night and you're thinking where can I go with the family oh let's drive to Calumet Fisheries <laughs> at 95th <laughs> and the Indiana border and everybody will eat uh, you know we'll eat fried shrimp watching you know the barges go by uh, here's my Calumet Fisheries story I was taken there a lot as a small child by my grandparents that was a thing like we're going to drive out we're going to get you know to go case of whatever fried shrimp or whatever it was and we'd eat and watch the barges as you describe i remember that vividly from when i was a kid what i didn't remember was the name of the restaurant oh (laughs) so i went for years in my head imagining that as being at navy pier because that was all i could place and it didn't 
didn't click for me until maybe 10 years ago. Oh, wait, I think that might have been on the south side. And I actually had to Google it. Like, I had completely, yeah. it, it faded from my mind. And I'm like, oh, my God, Calumet Fisheries. And then I started going back as an adult, and here we are. You know, I, I had an experience like that, too, where the, early on, one of my first ventures way to the south side to have something, it was a Cajun restaurant down on South Ashland. So I went to it. I kind of didn't even re really remember the name. I figured it was long gone. At some point, like 15 years after I went to it, I found out it, it had moved to Blue Island. It was Maple Tree oh, yeah. down in Blue oh, Island. Yeah. But it was still there, and it was really kind of, it's like being able to visit your dead grandparents at some point, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, really? That memory? It's I could like go have it again side. right now? That's kind of weird. <laughs> Uh, speaking of Maple Tree Inn, last I heard there was a horrible fire. Yeah, there. they burned down. They've opened oh, in a yeah. second building, and they're rebuilding their original building as best they can. Uh, but it was a historical building, and they had yeah. like a 100-year-old bar in it and stuff like that. So some of that's just gone forever. But it is a really nice place, and it's cool. I mean, Blue Island is one of those kind of fun, blue-collar, trapped-in-the-1950s kind of places uh, except there wasn't as much Mexican food in the 1950s no. there. <laughs> and so, I mean, it really, that was a great, you know, I want to feel like I'm out of town, but I only have two and a half hours. <laughs> you could head down there and really kind of have an out of Chicago experience and a great meal and then come back. So, Very true. All right. So to recap, to summarize what we've learned today, uh, <laughs> Kimsky is a must-visit restaurant. Absolutely. Uh, the, the food preparation, just right. the, the flavor. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> The, the flavors, the, the dishes, the, the inventiveness, uh, I'm a fan of it all. Uh, this, this was a wonderful Thank meal. Thank you so, so much. So really Appreciate wonderful that. job, Chef. Uh, and the book, Food Editor 99, Mike Gebert of Food Editor. Uh, Food Editor is hard to say out loud. Food Editor. Food Editor. <laughs> all hail Food Editor. I am Food Editor, the <laughs> giant robot. Sounds like a He-Man villain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but really, like for a lot of us who maybe in the 90s, looked forward to the monthly Chicago magazine to look at the restaurant reviews. That was the only way you could discover right. new restaurants. This, to me, is just that experience made better, more accessible, uh, and just more interesting. So well, Fooditor is the Chicago guide for restaurants. I, I can't recommend it enough. And we were talking before we came out. Um, Chef, was one of your staff going to go th like? make it a task to go to each of the 99 restaurants yeah our prep cook margaret who actually has a indian husband as well she does uh she's korean uh she was one of those uh kind of like i don't want to say one of those but she was like you know she's a she's a food blogger type um person before and i kind of challenged her to just be like hey you know you know why we get annoyed at a lot of those people that set up those fucking white boxes and take pictures of food on the floor and shit. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you why, because we, you know, there's a lot of care, no matter yeah. what the price point is. I, I want to challenge you to fucking be a prep cook and just see, just just take a gander of what it takes sometimes. And then she, uh, proud to say that she doesn't like a lot of those food bloggers anymore, uh, doesn't follow <laughs> them, but she's still very much into food, documents it in her own way, which is fantastic. She does her own pop ups for South Indian food. Oh, wow. And um, she, she's an adventurer and you know, when she, she got, I bought her, I bought my whole staff a copy of the book, and she is very adamant about visiting every single place or biking to most of the destinations. What a blast! Yeah, and she's, that's that's awesome. That's that's what I want the book to be. I want it to be a guide, you know, uh, like um, like a like a like an adventure guide sort of. <laughs> well, that's it. <laughs> to and rediscover it, the choose city. Choose your own adventure. Yeah. It, it is, and you'll never get bored. Yeah. Like, oh, Absolutely. we got 70 restaurants to go. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> we got to go to Pilsen tonight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's what makes it fun. That's what makes it an adventure. And just and then I think once you start going and venturing out, you realize how small the city can be. Exactly what we were saying. Yeah. It, it is. Everything's accessible. Because, you know, no one really goes to Inglewood. So, I mean, right. <laughs> you know, a lot of people's city scope is, ends at the back of the yards, you know, and that's only the 40s right there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There still goes all the way up to 130s. In the, the furthest south thing in the book, there's uh, a Middle Eastern restaurant called Al Safara Grills. It started as just like a meat counter, and they're like roasting lamb right there in the restaurant. You can tell <laughs> you can tell where it is because it's the giant cloud of smoke in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> and they I actually opened a much nicer restaurant, a fancier Middle Eastern restaurant. Uh, I'd have to even look up what suburb is it is but it's like on the 200s or something way down Jesus. there um and you know but uh hey 
You got you got an hour to drive to go eat Middle Eastern food. It's well worth it. So I'm sure it's worth it. I love it. Uh, Mike, you do a great job. Thank you for joining me on what is now an annual podcast. Thank you for having me annually. Uh, Chef Juan, I hope we're now best friends. Oh, absolutely. I can't wait to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's possible that could have sounded less sincere, but... No, no, it's it's uh, we're we're besties. Oh, yeah, fantastic! That's what Wait, I'm looking for. Wait, real quick though, are you woke? <laughs> I'm, dude, I am woke and lit AF. And I would never have expected to hear that out of Michael Gebert's mouth. Honestly, uh-huh. Uh-huh. I've seen a lot of things go in there, but never would I expect woke to come out of that mouth. Oh, the things we've seen go in Mike's mouth. <laughs> Where do we start? There should be a whole nother 99 right there. This is great. <laughs> Except it would be 199. And so the podcast spiral, spirals down Sorry. quickly. And that, that's a good time to call it quits. Uh, thank you for listening to Carco and Carney, presented by the Audubon Mazda of Evanston. Read Mike's book. Go to Chef Juan's restaurant. There we go. Thank